Welcome everyone. Uh, today I'm going to talk about anomaly detection. Uh, first, uh, I will briefly introduce uh, anomaly detection. What is anomaly detection? Uh, some applications, uh, that is different, different methods for anomaly detection and uh, some background. So the definition of anomaly detection, anomaly is a pattern in the data that does not conform to the expected behavior. Uh, but I, I like the more the definition of Hawking's saying that an, an outlier is an observation which deviates so much from the other observation as to arouse suspicious that it was generated by a different mechanism. Hmm? So anomaly detection is like, a fine, uh, like searching for a needle in a high stack where you have a, you have a shortage in time. So, and the high stack is burning. So it's, uh, it's, it happens, uh, it, it, it's, it doesn't happen frequently, but if it happens, it can be quite dramatic. Let's see some examples. So the, the most uh, useful applications of anomaly detection is in uh, detection of credit card frauds, where if you missed uh, uh, frauds, uh, you, I mean, your anomaly detection system missed this kind of transactions. Uh, it can lead to the contract termination. For instance, uh, companies like MasterCard and Visa Card, if a, a retailer uh, has a fraud rate of over than 1%, they revoke the term uh, contract with them. Or retailers for each $1 of direct fraud might lose $2.5. Uh, it's too much. And we don't like this to lose any uh, kind of anomalies. In the contrast, if you make false alarm, uh, uh, you block illegitimate transactions, so your card doesn't work. And banks lose lots of money because of that. So we don't like this and this, but we don't, we definitely don't want this. Another example in cyber attacks, hmm? if it is it, uh, intrusion happens, it can be a, a, a tragedy for many companies and organizations. For instance, in 2017, you are you familiar with WannaCry? It was in the news uh, over uh, everywhere. Hackers gain access to 200,000 uh, computers in 150 countries. So for a special case of NHS, National Health Institute of UK, they lost to 92 billion pounds because of cancellation of 19,000 uh, appointments. But in the contrast, if you would make a false alarm, probably you block some normal activities, huh? like uh, uh, which uh, negatively impacts the business in any way. But this is, of course, much worse. Look at another example. Uh, animal detection can be used in disease detection. For instance, in cancer, breast cancer. Now with AI, we can detect uh, breast cancer with 95% accuracy. But what if, if happened about the 5% we lose? If we don't, then the, the patient might die. Huh? But if you give a false alarm, you say, that, uh, say to a, a patient that doesn't have cancer that you have a cancer, the patient might be with fear and worry. And it also can be costly for the hospital. They need to they do the exams and follow-ups and, and anything like that. But if you are in, the, in this part that you detect the anomaly as a true anomaly, it's a victory. Huh? And if you say that a normal patient is normal, you didn't do uh, something special, right? Now let's uh, go to the, another example in terrorism attacks. For instance, in, if you in September 12, uh, 11 in United States, they could detect this event earlier. Uh, 2,977 people were alive. So sometimes missing one anomaly can be a catastrophic. Huh? So and two wars also happened because of that that event. Uh, but what happens if uh, one hour before that uh, we could detect? So none of this happened. But if we we did uh, we make some false alarms, what also it, it's also is negative for us because we may arrest innocent people. Hmm? Uh, we need to prepare for rescues. We need to send lots of ambulances, helicopters for nothing. Nothing happened. Oh, everything was fine. Uh, so these are the side effects of false alarms. And in the right side, you have also missed alarms. Now, I want to define animal detection. But before uh, defining animal detection, I want to create a toy data set. Huh? So let's imagine that I measure height and weight of 25 adults. And then I put them inside this 
let's say that in a scale of one to 10, huh? to a more simple example. So this guy with a weight of five and nine goes to this point. This guy to the, the five and 10, this guy to this point. And if we do this for the rest, we have a data set like this. So these points that you see in machine learning uh, 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 books, these are actually, I, I like this, this representation because people don't make me say, oh, what are these, these circles? Uh, circles are people. Circle can be patient, circle can be events. Okay, now I want to define un unsupervised detection. Look at this guy. It is very far from the rest of the data, right? So this is the task of unsupervised detection. You look at the majority of data points where are located. And then if someone is out of this area, we can flag it as an anomaly. This is an unsupervised way of doing that. There is another way of doing that. Let's say that we have a domain expert and sits there and label this data. Say that, okay, first example is normal. Second example is normal, but this guy is, is, is very strange. Height of one and weight of one. So if we fit this data into a supervised learning algorithm or classifier, it's create a line between normal examples and abnormal examples. This is what machine learning does, right? Supervised machine learning. Now for unseen examples, let's say you have two examples. We measure the weight and height, and then we put them based on their measure, put this in, in this space. So this guy, is located in the red part, so it becomes abnormal sense. This guy goes to the left, uh, right, uh, right uh, bottom, so it becomes normal. This is supervised learning, okay? And is applied to anomaly detection. So the difference of these two, okay? In supervised uh, anomaly detection, the criteria that we, we evaluate that one instance is abnormal is the similarity and distance between the samples. Hmm? So there is no labeling here. There is no cost for labeling. This is the benefit. We can detect unknown anomalies but with unsupervised methods, but they cannot detect already seen or known anomalies. Hmm? So they have far higher false alarm rates for this type of anomalies. On the contrary, supervised methods, the criteria is only the labels provided to them. Hmm? And they are more accurate in detection of known anomalies. Hmm? But labels can be expensive or inaccurate. For instance, if ask, we can we ask domain experts to label the data, it can be very costly. Hmm? Also, uh, like Google, for instance, if we put them on the shoulder of users to make us labels, like uh, Google report spam, uh, this also can be uh, inaccurate because I, I can be a crazy guy that puts every email uh, as a spam. Huh? This provides noise into the data. So, and they also cannot identify, identify unknown anomalies. So what is unknown anomaly and known anomaly? Hmm? Based on an evolution, we have learned that during uh, our evolution, we have learned that a snake can threaten our life. This is a known anomaly. Hmm? But what about we see a, a species like this? We don't know. It can or it might threaten our life or not. We don't know. So important point, if you have labeled data, doesn't mean that you don't need un 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 unsupervised anomaly detection. Why? Because you cannot detect this kind of cases. Hmm? So let's see an example. Let's see that your classifier separated the data points to two parts, red and green. And then we have this, uh, this guy that is located here. Do you think this is a normal instant? It is not, right? Because it's different from others. So if you just apply supervised learning, you can't identify this kind of cases. So you need to run unsupervised learning in addition to supervised learning. So our focus in this, in this uh, session is on, on unknown anomalies of unsupervised methods. But don't think that all, all unknown anomalies are harmful. We may have some cases that we, this guy is all unknown anomaly, but this is harmless, right? So, and, there, and, and, and then you should also differentiate between noise and anomaly, huh? For instance, this guy is a meaningful anomaly if his height is very low, but uh, with, with, a, with a normal weight, 
But this also can be due to measurement error. For instance, this, this device that measure height can be problematic and provides a uh, wrong input. Uh, so this is noise, and this is a meaningful anomaly. Hmm? Okay, the output of unsupervised methods are uh, pro uh, produce three types of uh, outputs, unsupervised methods. Rank, like if it's uh, into the top 1%, this is considered an anomaly. Anomaly a score, which is normally higher a score, means that the, the instance is more anomaly. And binary, binary labels that uh, some methods provide normal or abnormal. Okay. Now let's go to the univariate methods. So let's create the most basic anomaly detection system that you can create. Huh? Let's say that we have the height of 10,000 people. So we sort them. And we get the top one values from bottom and, to, uh, and the top. And then we call them auto anomaly. Hmm? This is very basic. But the problem is that, so the advantage is that it's very efficient, doesn't make any assumption. But the problem is that it's unable to quantify the outlier uh, degree of user, uh, unusualness. So for instance, it cannot say that this is a real anomaly. The difference is only 4. But the difference here is uh, 14. I don't know. It doesn't say anything about that. So let's go to for more advanced way of doing that. So another approach is box plots. Box plot is a, a standard a statistical uh, method that uh, works like this. You first get the quartiles of the data, Q1, Q2, Q3, which Q2 is median of the data. And then you compute the interquartile uh, range, which is the difference between Q3 and Q1. In our case, is 51. And then upper limits and lower limit are computed as Q1 minus 1.5 multiplied by IQR, this value, which will become 58. And the upper limit is 264. Based on this, we identify this as an outlier because it's over the upper limits. This is an approach uh, by box plot. This is parameter free. No, non, uh, so it's uh, non parametric doesn't make any assumption uh, on the distribution of data, is intuitive. But it fails for multimodal data, which is multimodal data. When you have you, uh, you identify two peaks in your data, it means that you have more than one subpopulation in your data. So you can you can do it with Python. I, I always in the slide I have this uh, blue titles is is a Python code. I don't explain this, but later you will have access to this code, so you can draw any any picture or a figure you find in the slide. You can you can regenerate yourself. Uh, so histogram is the next idea. So imagine that we have a histogram, and then we have some points that are located in these low-frequent beams. For instance, height of 2.45 or 1.2 can be outlawed for both males and females. But if we have 1.95, it can be outlier for females probably, and 1.45 can be outlier for males. Um, so this kind of outliers cannot be detected with the, with, the, with, the, with the box plots. But in histogram, you can observe this kind of things. And histogram work, works like that. You split the data into 24 pins, and then they create a table like this, and then you plot this. So based on that, this kind of low frequent beans are considered outliers. For instance, in this case, you see that uh, in bean one and two, we have only four instances and five instances. And for uh, bean 23 and 24, we have only four and one. So we, we, we think that there should be an outlier there. So this is a very efficient approach. The linear complexity, non-parametric, doesn't make any assumption about distribution data. The hyperparameter of the bean, however, is not intuitive to set and is sensitive. If you put uh, 20 beans, it's, you, you, you generate another set of results. OK, uh, this is a Python code for Instagram. Um, but now let's look at this data. It looks like a normal distribution, right? Hmm? Let's fit a normal distribution to this data. And it's, it fits uh, well, right? So look at the mean. Uh, mean is 161, and the standard deviation is 32. So what we can do with this? It means that we can forget about the, about the original data. Now, for explaining the whole data, I need two parameters, mu and sigma, two parameters of the normal distribution. I can explain anything with that. 
So from the normal distribution, we know that it's very low pro probability that points appear here or here. So what we can do with this? Let's compute mu minus three sigma. It becomes uh, 161 minus uh, three multiplied by 32, 32 becomes 65. And let's do this for the right side becomes 257. What we can do with this? It's, it says that if we have an instance that appear in this, the probability of instance appear here is 1.1%. So let's look at our data again. It's a sorted height of people. So this guy, it's, it's appeared here. So it's an outlier. And this guy also appeared here. So it's also in the right 0.1%. So it's an anomaly. So this is a code for Gaussian model. Uh, so. Normal distribution is one of many distributions. We have lots of more invented during the history by mathematicians and statisticians. Uh, so there are lots of them. Each of them have uh, some parameters. Normal distribution has a mean and a standard deviation. Other distributions have the, their own parameters. So the general approach for distribution-based anomaly detection is that you think that your data fits a specific distribution and then you choose your distribution. Then you estimate the distribution of parameters, uh, uh, parameters of the distributions, like mu and sigma in normal distributions. And then based on the likelihood of the tensor instance to be generated from this distribution, you detect an outlier, or a probability of that instance being become an outlier. This is called a parametric approach. If you, if you see somewhere in machine learning or data mining that they say non-parametric or, non -param or parametric, it's, it's because of this, because you estimate the parameter of a, a known distribution. So this is approach is efficient, is linear. It, uh, the scoring is intuitive, is a probability. Everyone knows probability, 5%, 1%, 1%, 1 0.0% is intuitive. No, 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 it's, uh, it's another thing. Um, and parametric assumption often do not hold for they, the real data. This is our big problem starts. Because uh, in real life, we don't find perfect uh, fit of uh, real data with this kind of distribution. So we need to go to more advanced methods. Also, can, as you saw in the examples, our data might have more than one subpopulation. So if it's males and females, Nordic or Asians. So if we, our data had this kind of uh, 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 properties, we need uh, more advanced distributions called mixture models uh, that uh, fits more than one distribution. Uh, so look at this example. If we uh, fit a Gaussian mixture model with two components to the same data set, you will have this data set in, in, I will give you the data set. You can do experiments with that. So then you find the two moves. So now you find the parameters of two distributions. This can be males or females, we don't know, or can be Nordic or Asian, we don't know. In the data, it's not specified. This data items belongs to which group? But from the peaks, we notice that, okay, there should be two subpopulations in the data. So this is an intuitive scoring like the previous one, but the advantage of this approach is that the number of subpopulations is not known. We should try different sub number of subpopulations and feed the data to see which one better works. This is a code for Gaussian mixture model. So now I, I ask a question. What happens if I have more than one feature? Uh, so I, I add weight to the height now. Uh, so let's see. So uh, we have multivariate approaches that deal with this kind of problems, but why we need them? Let's look at the box plots of this data. And look at this example. In this example, if we look at the, the height of this example, nothing is abnormal, right? And if you look at the, its, its weight, also it's nothing is abnormal. Everything seems normal. But if we look at both values together, it becomes abnormal. With, with this kind of settings, univariate methods are no longer uh, useful. We need multivariate methods. But these kind of outliers are easy to detect by univariate methods. For instance, this appeared in the box for a lot of weight and also appeared in the box for a lot of height. This one appeared in the box plot of weights, but not appeared in box plot anyway, is detectable with one of the box plots. But these are more dif uh, difficult to detect. So that's uh, the motivation of multivariate methods. So you can plot this also with this code. 
so there are some methods that are something between you between univariate and multivariate and one of them is histogram based outlier score and it turns out to be very successful i mean in real life applications it's it's working very good uh, so what is the idea of histogram based outlier score it's, uh, it creates two histograms, one from height and one from weight, right? One from height, one from weight. And then it looks uh, how samples are located in the which beans of these histograms. For instance, look at this example. For instance, this guy, his height is located in this bean, bean 21, which is very low frequent beans. We have only 23 other instances in this bean. So it turns out this is, a, this is an abnormal value for height. And then he, if you look at his weight, also his weight also has appeared in a low frequent bean, 68. So according to the Bayes theory, if we uh, pro, computing the probability of this event happens is that if we consider that these, these two events are independent of each other, probability of this happens is probability of this one multiplied by probability of this one. So the probability of is this one is 23 by 10,000. We have 10,000 examples. And this one is 68 by, divided by 10,000. So if you multiply this to probability, this is gives the probability of this observation. And HBOS just invert this and apply log transform on there. So this gives us HBOS a score of 11.06. Uh, now let's look at another example, this one. It's located in this bin, uh, this height, and this weight is located in this bin, eight, uh, which it is a very frequent bin. It means that there are lots of instances inside this bin. So this probability becomes higher. Look at this probability. And multiplication of two high probabilities with a higher probability, right? So it's higher probability for we have observation like this than this one. This is the idea of HBOS. Hmm? So if you compute this for any of these samples, those have that have HBOS values higher as possible are more abnormal. This is a, a basic idea that it works in practice. But, uh, and you can do it in, in Python with this few lines of code. Mm -hmm. uh, but the problem is that, uh, probably this method should have a problem with detecting these kind of uh, events hmm? because uh, it assumes that all of these features are independent. So we here come to the advantage and disadvantage of this method. Computation is very efficient, is linear, uh, and uh, with a fixed bean size and or n log n for dynamic bean width. Uh, so it's suitable for high dimensional data because it doesn't calculate any distance, uh, but it assumes that features are completely independent. So we cannot detect some of this multivariate outlier. So we need more sophisticated method. So this is a summary of statistical methods challenges. Uh, one is that we, in real life, we have multivariate data. We have multimodal data. We, we have more than one subpopulation of data. And our outliers can be also collective outliers. Mm -hmm. So many solutions uh, in the past years are, are developed for solving these kind of problems. So now we reach to the neighborhood based methods. The idea of neighborhood based methods is that they try to detect various types of multivariate outliers from low dimensional data. So we can have single outlier like this, we can have multiple uh, 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 single outliers, we can have outliers besides the dense area, which is harder to, de to detect. Uh, we can have outliers inside the dense area. Hmm? Uh, we can have multiple areas and outliers be, uh, uh, besides these two uh, dense areas. Uh, or, or we can have uh, vary, varying densities areas and outliers be, uh, close to these areas. This makes anomaly detection a, a challenging task because in real life data sets, we may have a combination of this type of outliers. Hmm? But uh, we try uh, our best to detect th some of those. So the, the most popular method uh, from neighborhood space approach is K nearest neighbors published in 2000. It compute the distances of all instances to their K nearest neighbors, and then compute the average of the distance or maximum or median sometimes. Um, and the data points that have top n percent average or maximum median distances 
are identified as outliers. The hyperparameters uh, are number of neighbors and n, which is the top n percent outlier. So let's look at an example. So let's say that we set k equal to 2 and n equal to 1. Uh, and then we, we put these two examples to see how it works. So first, um, we find the nearest neighbor of this point, this point A, reference point. Its near, nearest neighbor is, and I, I have to note that we are using Manhattan distance here for simplicity, but uh, these Python packages use, uh, uh, use equivalent distance, so the, the result of our example might be different from the Python result, uh, output that you get. So, uh, the, uh, so the distance of this A to N1, its uh, nearest neighbor is 11, right? 11 steps that you reach to the point N1. And then uh, their second nearest neighbor is located at 7, 6. So it becomes, uh, again, 11. Hmm? So average distance becomes 11, right? Now let's look at uh, for point B. Its nearest distance is located at one step away. So distance equal to one. And the second nearest neighbor is step one step away again. So average distance becomes one. Hmm. Now let's look at the point C. So the distance of A to its the C to nearest neighbor is three. Huh? Three steps you require to reach. And, and for the second nearest neighbor is also three. So the average distance becomes three. For the other points, if you look, all of them are one or 1.1. One, uh, one. one neighbor, one neighbor, average is one. One, and the second neighbor is two distance, average becomes 1.5, right? So if you put this in the table, it seems that these this, uh, instances uh, have average distance of one or 1.5. 1 C gets the average distance of 3.5 and A becomes uh, 12. Hmm? So average distance of A to its nearest neighbor is higher comparing the other points. So we call this guy outlier. So you can, uh, you can apply the same data. I put the, these data sets in the CSV files, and then you apply the Python uh, codes to this data and you find yourself this, this guy. Hmm? So local outlier factor. So K and N, unfortunately, cannot detect this kind of outliers close to the dense areas. Hmm? So LOF idea is that instead of the distance to nearest neighbor, let's compute the density of the distance, uh, the points. So the density around an outlier is considerably different to the density around the neighbors. Look at here, is the density is very high and the density around this point is very low, right? This is the basic idea of LOF. So let's see an example. So they introduce a concept, new concept called KN distance. It's very, if you look at the paper, you, you probably have difficulty understanding this, but I give you an intuitive uh, explanation. So KN distance is the distance to the KTH nearest neighbor. So what that means? If you put K equal to three, so it is, uh, this, this point is its first neighbor. This point is the second neighbor, right? And this guy is the third neighbor. So what is KN distance? Is the distance of that point to its third neighbor because we set K equal to three. So the three and distance of C becomes four. One, two, three, four steps, right? K and distance is space now is defined. All points within this time, within the this distance equal to four. How many points you find around C that have a distance of four to C? Only D, P1, P2, and three, right? This guy has more distance. This guy also, this guy also, this guy also. So we have only three points in K and distance. In this case, three and distance. Okay, now they define the local reachability distance and LOF based on local reachability distance. I give you an example. So to compute the LOF of C, we require the uh, reachability distance of its points in its K and distance space. That means P1, P2, and P3, right? So let's do it for P1. 3 and distance of K, Q1 
is one neighbor, two neighbor, three neighbor. So the, its third neighbor has a distance of one, so it becomes one. For K2, one neighbor, first neighbor, second neighbor, uh, third neighbor is this one or this one. So it's become two. For Q3, one neighbor, first neighbor, second neighbor, third neighbor, it becomes two. For Q4, first neighbor, second neighbor, third neighbor, so it's become one, right? So now the distance of C, uh, P1 to Q1 is one, right? So a reachability distance is defined as the maximum of between the distance of P1 to each of these points and their three n distance, which is this point, these values. So let's compute the P, uh, reachability distance of P1 to Q1. Hmm? The distance of P1 to Q1 is one, is one step away. And three, the end distance of Q1 is one. So maximum between one and one is one. Mm -hmm. Let's look at this example. P, uh, reachability distance between P1 and Q4 is two. The distance between P1 and Q4 is two. So we put two here. And uh, the, uh, the three end distance of Q, Q4 for, for one. So the maximum becomes two. Now we just write the inverse average of these values becomes local reachability distance. So if we sum off these values, multiply by four, and then inverse them, becomes 0 0.75, right? We do the same for its, uh, its second uh, point in K and distance of this point. So this time we have uh, more than uh, uh, five, uh, we have five, uh, uh, instances in K and distance of this P2. And with the same approach, we come to 0 0.55. And for P3, as the last one, we arrive to LRD of 0 0.75. Now we have LRDs for P1, P2, and P3. So what we do is that we compute the 3N distance of P1. 3N hmm? distance of P1 is, is what? It's his first neighbor, second neighbor, third neighbor. It becomes two. P2, one first neighbor, second neighbor, third neighbor, this one or this one becomes two. P3, first neighbor, second neighbor, third neighbor becomes one. So we put it in this. And then for computing LOF of C, we just need to sum of this LRD of these three uh, points in the Kn distance of C multiply by these three distance, or reachability distances becomes 16.9, uh, right? Now let's do it for B, for point B. We, we, we think that this is a normal instance. Huh? We see that for point V, uh, P1, reach, uh, 3N distance of Q1 is 1, Q2 is 1, Q3 is 1, and Q4 is 1. And the distance of P1 to each of them is also 1. So it becomes 1. 4 divided by 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 equal to 1. Let's do it for the second point. It's, it's, uh, it, this becomes 0 0.66. Third point becomes 0 0.8. It becomes 0 0.75. And then if, if, if with the same procedure, we obtain the LOF of B, 0 0.53, right? So let's compare this. Which one got a higher LOF score? The guy that was outlier. Hmm? And LOF is interpreted like this. If LOF is uh, lower than one, this means that the point is in, in a higher density than neighbors, is a normal point. If uh, LOF is equal to, uh, more or less equal to one, is similar density as neighbors, like, like this one. And if LOF is greater than one, is, is has a lower density than neighbors, like this guy. Hmm? And the higher, the higher anomaly. So if you apply a Python code on this data, you obtain anomaly score of 2.12 uh, for this uh, point C. Okay, now the issue is that LOF cannot dis distinguish between outliers uh, with the isolated property and outliers with low density. Hmm? This guy is, uh, is isolated, but is, is inside a dense area. So if you apply LOF, we cannot detect this kind of outliers. Hmm? So let's uh, look at how it works with LOF. 
So let's see. This is the first neighbor, second neighbor, third neighbor. So k and distance becomes uh, k and distance space becomes these three points. Let's compute the LRD for this point and this point and this point, and LOF becomes 0 0.26. Hmm? But according to the LOF, it says that this should be a normal instance, which is not. You think this is a normal instance? This guy? This is normal? Isn't it? So that's why uh, people developed a new approach called connectivity outlier factor. Hmm? COF developed uh, was developed in two, uh, 2002. The idea of this uh, is that outliers are points where their chaining travel cost to their third, furthermost neighbor is larger than their neighbors. Hmm? So they define a new distance called K and chaining distance, which is the, the lowest distance to travel from the point to the furthermost neighbor in K the K the K distance K and distance space. Let's see an example. So let's see that, let's set k equal to 3. So we find k and distance the space of f. You already know how to find the k and distance. Uh, so third neighbor and the distance to the k, third neighbor is equal to 2 here. So 3 and distance becomes these three points. Huh? 3 and distance the space of f is these three points. And now in the step 2, we compute the total chaining travel cost from f to the most far point in this k and distance space. So the most far point from F probably is this one or this one or this one. Doesn't matter. Uh, we assume that one of these because uh, all of them have the distance of two to F. So let's see uh, how is the cost, traveling cost from F to the, the, uh, the uh, most far point. So uh, we first can go from P1 and then go from P2 uh, and then P3. This is the one pass, right? So. The cost of traveling from F to P1 is 2 plus cost of traveling to P2 from P1 is 2 plus 4 because 6. Cost of traveling from P1 to P3 via P1 and P2 becomes 2 plus 4 plus 4 equals to 10, right? So the to total chaining travel cost becomes 18. This is the chaining travel cost. Hmm? So Attention, in chaining travel costs, direct travel from F to P3 is not allowed. So you cannot compute the distance from F to P3 and say two. No, you can't travel from the points direct to the target directly. You should go through the other members of K and distance from the lowest distance to maximum distance. So let's see another pass. We go from P to P1 and then P3 and then P2 becomes again 18, right? Then pass number three, we go to P2 and then go to P3 and then P1 is another way, right? Again, 18. P4, again, 18. P5, uh, pass four, uh, five, uh, again, 18. And pass six, again, 18. And this is a special, a special case. In some other cases, you might find other uh, uh, but anyway, what we want is the minimum distance. So among these passes, we we get the minimum distance. So if you had here 24, 25, 18, 18 becomes the minimum distance. So now what we need to do is to divide 18 by 6. Huh? Minimum distance divided by 6 number of possible ways becomes 3, right? So it was three possible ways to go from F to FP3, and the minimum distance obtained chaining travel distance was 18. So it becomes three. Now let's compute the average travel cost for the points uh, uh, for the in F's three and distance space. For I mean these points P1, P2, and P3. We do the same thing. We see how many possible ways you can we can reach through the furthest further point. Uh, here we have six possible ways. So 10 is the minimum distance. One plus one plus two plus one plus two plus three becomes 10. Now let's compute for P2. It becomes 11. There are number of possible passes P multiplied by P plus one divided by two becomes six. And the average comes uh, 
uh, 11 divided by 6 becomes 8.83. Uh, 8 Let's do it for P3 as well. You see here is 9 and then divided 9 by, by 6 is becomes 1.5. So now we can compute the COF of F. We are ready to do that. So we have the average chaining travel distance cost for F is equal to three. Average chaining travel cost for P1 is 1.66. For P2 is 1.83. For P3 is 1.5. And then if we compute the mean of this, this average chaining travel cost becomes 1.66. Now we divide this three average chaining travel cost of F to buy 1.66 becomes 1.8. If you do the same thing for point B, let's see how it is. Mm -hmm. Again, 3N distance space, minimum chaining travel cost is 16 divided by uh, 10 becomes 1.6. Let's do it for its, its points in K and distance airspace. Here it is more complicated. So it's uh, 36 and divided by uh, 28 because we have seven points. So uh, th there is a 28 number of possible ways to go from P1 to this last point. And then we do the same thing for P2 and it's because 1.5 and P3. 1.5 and P4. So 1.08. Now we can compute the COF of P, uh, B. It's, it's average training travel cost for B, 1.6, divided by mean of these values for its, its points in Canyon distance space because 0 0.92. Now compare these two points. This guy now got a higher COF score than this guy. LOF could not do, uh, distinguish between these two points. So F is a real anomaly and COF could detect it. You can do this same thing with a Python code. Uh, so this is the summary of this neighborhood based approach. If you have a single outlier, K and N, LOF and COF can detect it. If you have multiple outliers, a seal, these methods can detect it. But if you have an outlier beside the dense area, only LOF and COF can detect. If you have outlier inside the dense area like this, only COF can detect that. If you have multiple areas, density areas, LOF and COF can detect. And if we have the multiple groups of with various densities, varying densities, only COF can detect. So you need to know, know how to distinguish. So this advantages now. These methods, neighborhood-based methods, do not make any assumption about the data distribution, so they are non-parametric approach, and they are normally accurate for low-dimensional data, but they, this comes with the costs. The computational ex, uh, computations are expensive, they are quadratic, uh, time complexity, cannot detect collective outliers with low density, and uh, for outliers with a score greater than one, it's hard to interpret uh, whether this is an anomaly or isn't it. Uh, and the results also might be sensitive to the choice of car, uh, which is number of neighbors. And neighborhood is meaningless in high dimensional data. So let's go to the uh, one class classification approaches. Uh, we don't have much options here. One of the most popular one is one class SVM. Probably you have learned, learned this in your supervised uh, learning course. Uh, the basic idea is that uh, one class SVM tries to find the simplest and most compact region of a space where the majority of data I, I concentrate on this majority of data sample lives with the highest density. This is a special thing about SVM that uh, is more tolerant uh, towards outliers. So actually SVM, what is uh, special about the SVM is that these two soft and hard margins. So other machine learning algorithms only care about this, but SVM is tolerate towards some outliers that are located in, in this highway, right? So it says that you are located in this highway. I don't, I don't flag you as an anomaly. I, I just call you uh, someone that is uh, by chance is here. <laughs> so then uh, outliers are those that violates the hard margin. Huh? 
So it tries to minimize the density of normal uh, samples while keeping the number of outliers as desired. So in this case, I said I, I, I have three outliers. So SVM uh, find this highway such a way that it gives a higher density, uh, minimize the density of this area, and also give us three outlier points that are uh, further away. So if you apply this so with, uh, with a Python code and you put here three outliers, SVM finds, finds for you three outliers. If you say I want four outliers, just put this contamination uh, ratio four, then SVM consider this also as an outlier. So it's very sensitive to the number of uh, outliers that you say uh, I want uh, this number of outliers. So if I, I say five outliers, SVM also says that, okay, now this guy is outlier as well. So it's uh, this is the drawback of uh, SVM. So it can be used for both uh, uh, detection of existing instances as well as future un unseen instances like in novelty detection. And it can be both linear and non-linear. This is the great advantage of on-class SVM. Uh, but uh, as I told you, it's uh, sensitive to the input parameter of proportion of outliers. And also it has a poor performance on high dimensional data. This is another uh, disadvantage. Then we have clustering based approaches. Uh, so the key assumption of clustering approaches is that normal data records belong to large and dense clusters. Hmm? And anomalies do not belong to any of those clusters or they are very far from those clusters. So that, uh, we have lots of clustering algorithms. So uh, definitely we have uh, lots of outlier based uh, methods based on clustering algorithms as well. Uh, so the general approach is that we, we pick our clustering algorithm of our interest. We cluster the data uh, into let's say K clusters and then we have some criteria for uh, anomaly. Data, data, data records that do not fit into e each of these clusters or outliers. Mm -hmm. Also, a small or low density clusters also can be a kind of a collective outlier as well. For instance, look at this cluster. It has only three members. So probably this one also is a, can be a, a collective outlier. Or those points that are far from uh, their uh, neighbors in the clusters. These also can be uh, outlier. For instance, these two points also can be an outlier. This is the basic idea of clustering. We have a very popular uh, clustering algorithm uh, that also can be used for anomaly detection. It's called DBS scan. It's very famous uh, in the literature of data mining. It's mostly used for clustering, but also it has a very uh, good uh, potential for being used for anomaly detection. Look at how uh, DBS scan works. So we first uh, pick a point, random point in this space, as uh, this one, right? And then we create a circle around this point with the radius of one. This is the input parameter of a DBS scan. And they say that I want minimum four members inside the circle. So if there, this condition was met, then I create a cluster with this. Hmm? So now I have five members in the cluster. Then I, I do the same procedure for each member of this cluster. Uh, I make circle for each of these uh, non-visited instances. And then if th there are uh, points, for instance, for this one, you see there are five members. For this one, there is five members. So we create, uh, we add them to the cluster as well. Hmm? Now let's do this for the other points. We see that in this circle, the condition minimum number of points is not met. So we don't add this guy here. So we leave it and then go to pick another random point. And then we go here. We don't see a um, uh, required number of supports. So this is a noise. And this also, if we continue iteratively, we visit all these data points. And finally, you feel fine at uh, this kind of uh, uh, clusters uh, where some some of these points do not belong to any clusters and some point which also some of them can be collective anomalies and sometimes can be isolated anomalies. Um, you can apply if you run this code on Python with the same data sets uh, so Python finds for you these uh, six outliers uh, uh, but you need to set these parameters. <laughs> 
and then it's hard to set that. Uh, for this a, a, a special example, I, it's very easy, but in the large data sets, uh, normally it's, it will be difficult. So uh, the uh, clustering-based approach uh, in general can, our potential to detect collective outlier, but it depends on the number of clusters that we set and this kind of things. Uh, and then we can benefit from the advances in clustering algorithms. <laughs> Their advantage is that they are optimized to find clusters, not outliers. Uh, so any similar group of objects would be recognized as a cluster, although they can be outlier groups. Uh, so it's hard to distinguish noise from outliers. If normal points do not create any clusters, it fails. Uh, they are computationally expensive. For instance, DBS scan is quadratic comp type of complexity. Uh, it's hard to set the hyperparameters sometimes uh, uh, for this type of clustering like uh, DBS scan, and they are distance-based. So I will tell you why. Uh, uh, so they are not useful for high-dimensional data. But what is high-dimensional data? Uh, to give you a clue of what high-dimensional, I created a, this uh, toy example of friends. All of you probably have seen this fantastic uh, comedy series. So there were six characters that were living in an apartment, right? So I asked them about their required features for dating. Huh? So Joy says that for dating someone, I just need that, guy, that the girl should be nearby, right? Uh, so he's a very easygoing guy. Um, Phoebe also is like that. Uh, Chandler is a bit more, uh, has more preferences. He says that it should be nearby, it should be loyal and funny. Uh, Rachel says that it should be nearby, rich and funny. And Rod says that you should be re, uh, nearby, beautiful, funny, intelligent, loyal, caring, kind, educated, open-minded, self-confident, fit, and something else. And then uh, we have Monica that is, uh, it, it, it has some strange uh, uh, preferences. That it should, the guy should be white, it should be muscular, it should be rich, honest, secure job, romantic, short hair, non-smoker, tall, Jewish, funny, family-oriented, blue eye, listen to rock music, and, and have no tattoos. So... These, these two are perfectionists, these two are average, and these are easy goings, huh? And then we have a seventh uh, case, which is Alice. Alice is interested to sugar daddy, uh, luxury house, luxury car, and luxury boat, and he prefers that the daddy also has a fit body. So it's, it's a kind of outlier. So I, is it give, uh, I give you an, as an example of outlier. So now let's put these uh, preferences in the table, huh? Uh, for the Joey, uh, it has a nearby only. Uh, for uh, Chandler, uh, uh, nearby, funny, loyal. If we put for all of them, that our feature matrix becomes like this. Hmm? So, if imagine that we are in one-dimensional space and we have only one criteria, and which is the geographic proximity. So in this space, everyone is matched with everyone, right? Except Alice. Alice doesn't care. He can travel to any part of the world. He finds his desired sugar daddy. So uh, here, uh, he doesn't get any match. She doesn't get any match, but this six person give a 100% match if they want. Now let's increase the dimensionality of the data. Let's consider two criteria. Huh? Now in the new space where nearby, being nearby and being funny is important, Chandler has a chance of 100% with... Uh, with this and Ross also. And for the rest, they still have 50% of the uh, match chance. Hmm? It's still Alice doesn't have any chance in this space. Hmm? Now let's go further. Let's go to three-dimensional data where we have only, we have three criteria, nearby, funny, and loyal. Huh? So the chance of Chandler is decreased from 100% to 66% with uh, these two uh, girls. And Ross also can have a match of 66% with Rachel. And the rest also, their ch match chance is decreased to 33% because out of three criteria, they got only one. Still, Alice doesn't get anything, right? So now let's go to 15-dimensional data. Huh? So now we have everything, every features here. Huh? So now let's look at this. Uh, the chance of Joey finds his desired uh, uh, mates is uh, 1 to 15. It becomes 6%. And uh, Chandler also becomes 13. 
And the good news for Alice, he, now he got 6% of chance. And why? Because he has a one thing in common with Ross. Here is a fit body, right? <laughs> so let's compare this, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, four cases. Uh, you can see that, um, let's investigate this case. Joy and Phoebe uh, has a 100% chance in one dimensional space. What they have, their chances decrease to 6%, one divided by 15. And then let's look at this example. Alice didn't have any chance in one dimensional space, but then he has the same chance as Phoebe and, 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 and Joey, uh, 6%, right? So by, we noticed that by increasing dimensionality of data, chance of match is decreased for similar people, similar people, and is increased for irrelevant people, right? This is called curse of dimensionality, right? In machine learning, you always hear about high dimensional data, curse of dimensionality. This is the curse of dimensionality. So you see here, 100% goes down to 6, 0% goes to 6. So at the end, everyone is similar to everyone, even irrelevant people. So this is the curse of dimensionality. So in high dimensions, Distance matrix for this reason, distance matrix such as equality and distance and neighborhood concept does not make sense anymore. So if you apply KAN method, nearest neighbor method on data with 1000 features, you are doing something wrong. And when you are doing that, remember this example, right? <laughs> everyone is similar to everyone. Okay, so but why we have high dimensional data? Because in the past, Data collection used to be expensive. Today is not expensive. Today's uh, uh, data is uh, uh, collection and storage of data is cheap and fast. Uh, in the past, features were carefully selected by the domain expert. Now we collect everything. We put all the features inside the feature matrix. Doesn't care it's, if it's relevant or it's not relevant. Just just put it there, <laughs> you know. And so final data set in the past contain only few relevant high quality features, but now there are many of them, some of them are irrelevant. This is the problem of high dimensional data. Hmm? So the solutions for anomaly detection from high dimensional data are, I, I, I just here present three groups of solutions. There are more solutions, of course, but we can have, don't have time to present all of them. One group is dimensional deduction techniques like PCA, matrix tensor factorization and autoencoder. Uh, there are another group, uh, angle-based methods, uh, and then we have ensemble approaches, which are more recent, and it seems that they are becoming a trend in anomaly detection because of their high uh, performance. So let's uh, talk about dimensional reduction methods. This is the principal component analysis. Are you familiar with PCA? Of course you are familiar with PCA. So PCA finds principal axes such that data instances can live in a more compact space. So let's look at this. This is a data of height and weight, right? So let's if rotate this data like this, and instead of that bo big box, we put this box, right? Now data becomes more compact and no, none of the instances becomes out of the box. So why we need the, such a huge data space, such a large box? while we can present the data in this smaller box. This is the idea of PCA. So this is the principal axis one, which is called principal component one, and this is principal axis two. Hmm? What is the property of PCA? So as you can see, if you look at this, what PCA does actually is that it uh, uh, it's, uh, decreased the, the uh, actually the space required for keeping the data. So as you can see, the properties uh, of X and Y have the same variance, have the same variance, while this one has a different variance in the PCA space. And X and Y are perpendicular to each other, and in PCA also, these two also are perpendicular. This is the properties. Hmm? So how do we find PCA? It's based, based on singular value decomposition, where singular vectors are direction of principal axes, and singular values represent the scale of principal axes, and or with again decomposition of covariance matrix, where 
uh, eigenvectors represent the direction of the for axis and eigenvalues the scale of the for axis. Hmm? So if you want to do PCA, uh, use PCA for anomaly detection, we need to make one assumption. And that assumption is that in the new principal space, normal instances can still be distinguished from outliers. This is the principal assumption if we want to use PCA. Look at this example. So, for instance, in this example, if we project this data only to the principal axis one, like this, and look at the outliers, outliers is still are distinguishable here. And look at the original data. This is the outliers and this is the outliers. So why we need to keep, still keep this data? We need to go, we can do more compress the data. Huh? So if we just keep the first principal component, we can even go to more compact space and, and see patterns more clearly. Hmm? So this is called PCA with all components, and this is PCA with only first component, right? You can do this, uh, use the PCA for anomaly detection in the Python package. Um, I don't talk about the codes. Uh, principal component analysis uh, advantages. So the first advantage is that it alleviates us from cares of dim dimensionality. Uh, so we can apply PCA and then we get released of that uh, high dimensionality. And then we can use neighborhood based methods, clustering based methods, classification based methods. Uh, and it can work with a small sample. I mean, it doesn't need a large number of samples like methods like autoencoder. I will explain autoencoder as well. But there are disadvantages. As, as I said, outliers might not be distinguishable in the reduced space. Like that example I showed, there might be the case that outliers get mixed with the, with the other normal examples. If they are computationally expensive for high dimensional data, uh, they require that features must have the same scale. So we need to do, of course, need to do normalization before applying PCA. Independent features uh, would not be reflected in PCs. It fails when the data contains a large, large, large number of outliers. So maybe you need, if you have a large number of outliers, data is corrupted, you probably you need to use um, a, a robust version of PCA, lower robust PCA. Uh, it cannot be used for missing data or sparse matrices. I will explain, I will focus on this uh, in the next slides. And also PCA is a linear method. Uh, cannot capture nonlinear relationship. I will cover this one as well. So let's see what is the sparsity. Huh? So as I told you before, uh, for uh, computing PCA, we could do it with SVD, right? Uh, so if you apply, uh, we run, you run this code, and this data is also available. You don't need, you don't need to copy paste it. It's, I give you this CSV file. So you, have, you apply, it gives you this huh? U, uh, sigma, and V. Uh, but if there are some missing values inside this matrix, and you apply the same code, you received this from Python. What that means? That means that it's not possible to compute this VD of a matrix with missing values. Why? Because covariance matrix, if it's not full, how you can compute the SVD, right? So, but what is a sparsity? Huh? So, in this example, we didn't ask Joey to, to uh, talk about the preference. He just we ask him about his own preferences. He said, "Just I was I, I want a nearby person." Hmm? He didn't ask, "Do you like short hair? Or do you like a good body?" Because he didn't have any idea about the preferences of others, right? So the data for these features for Joy is missing. You cannot put zero there because if you put zero, it's dangerous. That means that Joy doesn't have interest to these features. So missing data is different from zero. Zero has a meaning, has a physical meaning. It means that I have no interest to this feature. So if you do this for all the rest, then there are lots of question mark. There are lots of missing values. So let, let's look at again for limit ourselves to one dimensional data. A sparsity is one to seven. There is one question mark and there are seven observ six observation, uh, um, observed observations. And then we have seven cases, so it becomes one to seven, becomes 40%, 14%. If you go to total dimensions, become 35% sparsity, becomes 52% by 3D data, 10D, 72%. And finally, with 15 dimensions, we have 78%. This is a high number of missing values. 
So the solution for factorizing or uh, reducing the dimension of these kind of data is no longer PCA. It's matrix factorization. Huh? So we, we cannot have exact solution, but we can have an approximate solution. So what's, what matrix factorization does? If you give a data with missing values, uh, it finds us two matrices, P and Q, huh? by this size, N by K and N by, uh, N by K, where the size of original matrix is N by M. So such that the product, inner product of these two matrices reconstructs or approximates the original data. So it's called low rank approximation. Since we have missing values, we cannot apply PCA to this data. We need to approximate that with optimization. So how matrix factorization works? So we, if you are, uh, matrix factorization give us these two factor matrices, we, if you make an inner product of these two factors matrices, gives us the original data, approximation of original data. Look at this example, how close these values are. One, 0 0.97, 1 0.061. Let's see this example, 3.00 and three. It's very close, right? It's, it's worked very good. Uh, so if we want to construct this value, we need to just make a dot product of this first vector corresponding to the S1, S1, F1. We want to compute the S1, F1. So from, from P matrix, we get the row, first row of S1, and then we get the column from Q matrix of F1, because we are interested to the F1. So this, if we make a dot product of this, this reconstruct this value. This is how we can make predictions even for non uh, missing values, but we are not interested into this. People in recommender systems are very interested to this kind of uh, features. So the error, prediction error becomes this one minus this one, right? Becomes this value. So if we, if we put all these values in the reconstruction error matrix, Let's do another example. This one is S6, F4. We go to this uh, table, S6 and F4, multiply, make a dot product of these two vectors, and this becomes this, right? What is the error? It's 0 0.05. We put this in the reconstruction error, right? If we do this for all point observe points, we don't care about the missing values. We don't because we want to see compute the error. We cannot compute the error between missing value and, and, and the prediction. So matrix factorization minimizes the reconstruction error via optimization. This is the basic idea. So you compute the sum of the squared estimation of errors. For instance, this error power two plus this error power two plus all of this error power two becomes this value. And matrix factorization during the optimization by iterations tries to reduce this error from 32, 32, 12, and then 0 0.09, right? So, and then if we say that our tolerance for error is 0 0.1, this is a stop point. Okay, it's good enough, stop iterations. So you are familiar with this, huh? gradient descent in machine learning. So the error goes down here, and here is lower than 0 0.10, we stop here. So we do this with gradient descent. If you're not familiar with gradient descent, I'll give you an example. Hmm? So do you know how to calculate the root square of a number? A square root of a number, do you know? In mathematics in high school, right? <laughs> so, but you can do it with Newton, Newtonian optimization. What is Newtonian optimization? It says that the value of uh, x at t plus one is equal to value of x at t minus f a x t divided by derivative of f f a x t at t, okay? So we, we, we formulate this uh, like this. We write like this, and then f a x becomes x, x power two minus a. Mm -hmm. So derivative of this function, it becomes two x, right? Now, if we put this, this value and this value, and xt together we, and simplify it, we arrive to this point, right? You can, in home, you can follow this and then see how we arrive from this to here. This is 
uh, updating rule that we obtained for iterations. So here, now we start with their initial guess. We say, okay, let's put one. Hmm? We put one inside this, and A is two, because we want a uh, square root of two. If you put in these equations, it becomes 1.5. Error is minus 0. Point, because if you multiply 1.5 by 1.5, it it's uh, uh, it's it has an error of uh, minus 0 0.522, right? Then we put this 1.5 in the next iterations as the input, as the next guess, and then we obtain this. So the error becomes so low. In the next iterations, it the error <laughs> becomes much lower, and finally it's is be is is going like uh, with uh, 10 power minus 12 precision. So this is initial guess. Hmm? This is update rule. This is iterations. And this is a stop, a stop uh, tolerance error, right? In gradient descent, you have all of this. So look at the code of matrix factorization. You have initial random guess. You generate two random factor matrices. You have iterations. Here we said 10, 100 iterations. And you have update rule that is uh, that is computed based on the derivative of the function uh, uh, loss function, and then you have a stop iteration tolerance error limit. It says that if error limit is going that lower than this, we stop. Huh? It's nothing complicated. It's like finding a, a square root. Hmm? So if we apply matrix factorization now that you know how matrix factorization is calculated, now we have two two factor matrices P and Q. Hmm? P, U, P is a lower dimension for the for the samples and and uh, Q is a lower dimension for features. What that means? What I can do with this? Okay, let's have a careful observation. If we look at this group, group one, we see that nearby got the highest score here, 0 0.9, and we know that Joey, the only interest that he had was to being nearby, and he had he had got uh, he had got a very high score on on this uh, latent factor, latent factor four, and latent variable four. So probably that latent variable corresponds to proximity. Huh? This is kind of interpretation we can do from matrix factorization results. Now let's look at another example. Let's look at the latent variable number two, personality. Look, loyal got the highest score here, hmm? and we know that Rachel had this interest, huh? 0 0.7. So probably this, this, this uh, latent variable relates to personality characteristics. Huh? Now go for the P2, latent variable number two. We see that, uh, number three, sorry. We see that for instance, tall here, tall is uh, 0. Uh, so, uh, yeah, physical, yeah. Tall here got a score of 0 0.9. Hmm? Uh, and then uh, who got the score? Ross. Ross had some preferences on the body and these things. So probably uh, this uh, P3 is related to physical attributes, right? And then if you go for uh, for P, uh, related variable number five, we see that, okay, oh, luxury house has uh, got a very high score here. Um, so probably this relates to the money, right? So P, latent variable uh, uh, five is corresponding to money, group four. And then the rest of the features are also in this group. This is how we interpret these latent variables. These latent variables, uh, in this example, is very simplified. Each latent variable is related to one concept, but sometimes each related variables can be combination of multiple concepts. For instance, money plus proximity. Money plus proximity plus something else. So, but in this simplified example, you find how you can interpret this. So these are called latent variables, but what is, in, is interesting for us in data mining and anomaly detection is this one. This is a new feature matrix, all dense without any missing values, and from dimensionality of 15, we move to five dimensions. Now we have a low dimensional data. This is the benefit, right? 
So if you want to do anomaly detection with matrix factorization, you can apply matrix factorization, and then you obtain this matrix P here from he here, and then you put a P in the KNN uh, function. Uh, so instead of original data, you use this uh, lower dimensional feature matrix. And then the rest is the same. The, you, you already know about nearest neighbor methods, how LOF works, how COF works, how KNN works. But this is the principal idea of matrix factorization. And matrix factorization got popular in 2009 because the people who won Netflix $1 million prize uh, used matrix factorization in their uh, approach. Hmm? So it's quite popular in recommender systems. Huh? Netflix uh, still are, are using matrix factorization in making recommendation. For instance, what movie you will be interested to watch tonight? It's exactly the same problem, isn't it? Just as the estimation of that missing values. Hmm? For instance, recommending Joy, are you interested to, to Blue Eye? Something like that. So, uh, advantages. They are versatile tools. They, uh, five uh, <laughs> five uh, things you can do with the same computation. Clustering samples and features. Yes? Yes, it still is useful. Yeah, even people are using matrix factorization when the sparsity is, is like 99.9%. Uh, .9%. Still it works. Yes. Don't think that big matrices are dense. Always big matrices are very sparse. Google matrix, for instance, is very sparse. Very sparse. So they are versatile tools. They can be used for clustering samples and features. They can be used for direct and interpretable outlier detection. They do dimension reduction. They do missing value estimation. And they are used for noise removal as well. So fantastic, right? With paying linear complexity method, you are doing five things at the same time. Non-parametric, they don't make any assumption about the distribution of the data. And their optimization-based approach allows to also to say to constraints. For instance, to say, I, I want to factor matrix with all, all scores with neg non-negative values. This has applications in, in many domains, for instance, in, in neuroscience, in brain imaging, because all the values are positive, and then negative appearing near, near uh, negative values uh, is not interpretable. Uh, but anyway, they can be sensitive to uh, the number of uh, latent variables that we set, because we always need to tell matrix factorization how many latent variables I would like to have. So five, six, seven, I don't know. And the, the, the results might be sensitive to this. Hmm. Um, and they, are, they have difficulty in capturing multiple relationships in higher order data. What is higher order data? Huh? Do you know what is higher order data? I'll give you an example on the friends again. <laughs> so imagine that I asked uh, friends on 2001, and that feature matrix was related to 2001. Now imagine that again they gathered together and I asked them again same questions and got their answer. Huh? So this was the, the preferences in 2001. And this is the preferences in 2020. Now we have some changes, huh? For instance, look at this, this feature, family oriented. So they, they become mature and they become uh, middle age. Now they care more about the family oriented guy. Huh? So there are new features appear and some features disappear. Huh? So there are some temporal dynamics in this data. So imagine that if we put them these two matrices together, imagine that I asked the same questions in 2016, 2011, 2006, and uh, 96. So we have a new dimension in our data, time, which is the context. So we already had the features in the, in the columns, and we had the samples in the rows. So this created a tensor, right? This is called the higher order tensor which in this case, order is equal to three, okay? So what we can do with this, uh, so uh, we can factorize it again, like matrix factorization, but if we have additional factor matrix here, which is related to time, right? What I can do with this? But uh, if you, it's the same idea, but uh, it's contrary to matrix factorization, to reconstruct this original data or approximate this original data, you need to do a chronicle product of this. Theory. This is more complicated, complicated mathematically, but you just, you just have an idea. Is a, 
uh, we one should be uh, we have outer product and, and to to re recall you out what is outer product in in uh, in linear algebra is is like this uh, but don't get very confused with this is similar idea hmm? so now imagine that i already interpreted the the columns uh, what are the latent variables and these things uh, and don't apply these numbers don't think that the numbers are fake i just wanted to simplify things to explain you this concept but other numbers in other slides are real <laughs> except this slide okay so uh, so what i can do with this new time factor matrix this is very useful information look at this the weight uh, of proximity uh, uh, latent variable got a score of one in all years what that means that means that being nearby always matter irrespective of, irrespective of time so it, this preference doesn't change with time always people date with people nearby they don't like to date people with 1000 kilometers away okay second thing we observe from this feature matrix look at this money and physical attributes got a score of one during the first three uh, the first three uh, time points where people were younger right and this uh, this has an interpretation as interpretation is that when people are young they care more about the money and physical attributes and then when we become mature we care about more about the personality so personality got a higher score in 2011 2016 and 2021 what else so we observed that others criteria got a score of one in 2001 and got a score of zero in other years what that means that means that probability weird criteria like blue eye or rock music loving preferences probability uh, probably has been related to some hype in 2001 probably there was a rock star with blue eye and all people had these uh, preferences uh, in that year but then this disappeared in other years right so what next so this new feature matrix these new latent features actually have modeled this kind of temporal evolution right so contrary to matrix factorization temporal dynamic of samples are also taken into account their contextual information here time so we have more accurate dimension reduction huh? so look at the alice alice for alice the criteria has always been the money right so from 1096 uh, to, 12, to uh, 2021 he always uh, wanted sugar daddy so his uh, her preferences didn't change at all so he's not dependent so his temporal evolution is different from temporal evolution of other normal guys their preferences together changed from physical appearances to personality but alice always was the same so we have more accurate dimension reduction because we take we, ta we have taken account this this contextual information so and then you may ask do we have higher order data more than three of course we have look at this uh, image this is a gray scale picture this is a matrix or second order tensor vector is a one order tensor and and a scalar is zero order tensor anything is tensor that is why tensor flow is called tensor because they want to be more generic they, they they want to input data can be any high any order of data okay so then if you have a color picture color picture is a three or the order tensor because we also have channel information which uh, models the red green blue numbers right weight of green group group and then if we add more context to this video data video color video data this is a force order tensor right so we cannot we can we can apply tensor factorization on this data but mark this factorization cannot be applied on the second and the third case right you need to have a special tool and that tool is tensor factorization okay the idea of how to calculate tensor factorization is like a matrix factorization is nothing uh, very different but the most common uh, optimization method is alternating list sequel method uh, the general idea is that you generate three random factor, factor matrices you fix two matrices and optimize for the third one 
then you fix the other two and they optimize for the, 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 the other ones and iterate until convergence. So this is the basic idea of how we use uh, tensor factorization in anomaly detection. We, we have a higher order data of a, a sparse data. We apply tensor factorization. We get a two-dimensional data or three-dimensional, any, any dimension you want. And then you apply this kind of COF, uh, nearest neighbor clustering or anything, any method that works for low dimensional data. So this is a code from scratch. You can see this is a very few lines of codes for computing the tensor factorization. And this is the ALS part. You compute, uh, you optimize for A first, and then you optimize for B, and then you optimize for C. You can run this code to see how, how iteration works, uh, how uh, convergence happens, and these things. So uh, these advantages is that uh, there is uh, the advantages is that it's the only context ever dimension reduction method on the earth. You don't have more options. And uh, but the problem is that the rank of tensor is unknown. Uh, numerical methods are less mature comparing matrix factorization. Um, you may uh, never get a convergence. Uh, this can happen also. And they cannot uh, detect nonlinear relationship. So that's why we arrived to autoencoder, right? Autoencoder, contrary to PCI matrix factorization and tensor factorization, which are linear dimensional detection methods, can capture nonlinear relationships. And what is nonlinear relationship? This is a nonlinear data. And then we want to separate this, this uh, uh, green from black. If we apply PCA or tensor factorization, matrix factorization, it becomes like that. But if you apply an autoencoder, Auto encoder can uh, distinguish these two non-linear separatable data. This is the idea. So auto encoder actually learns, first learns to encode data from input layer to a latent space and then try to decode that latent space into the again to the original data. Huh? So imagine that we are learning to how to do a dimension reduction for 110 digit two to give uh, some number of some examples of uh, digit two. And then we, uh, we give this to the autoencoder. Autoencoder finally learns a latent space like this. And then after we learned the model, we give this example to autoencoder, learned autoencoder, autoencoder uh, this output. We computed the difference, local con uh, reconstruction error of this one and this one. The output of autoencoder and the original data. It is a low reconstruction error, right? But now imagine that we give this to autoencoder. Autoencoder has learned uh, uh, the properties of number two. He doesn't. Uh, he has not uh, learned how this look, this this uh, irrelevant object. So it gives two as an output. Then if you compute the reconstruction of this object, and the autoencoder output is as a higher reconstruction error. That's why. How, that's how we use an autoencoder for anomaly detection. Just compute the reconstruction error of the output after learning. So this is the code. Uh, so this is an autoencoder is simple and generic to different type of data. It, 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 it can also accept tensors, uh, higher order tensors. Uh, you don't need to understand your data to use the autoencoder. Uh, it alleviates the problem of careful of dimensionality. It captures both linear and nonlinear relationship data. Uh, and can't handle noisy data. Not very much, although, uh, because if, if you have a much very noisy data, then you have lots of problems. So uh, it's not an interpretable model, like uh, other deep learning. It's a black box model. Uh, you cannot have that nice interpretations that we had for that case that, okay, nearby is, uh, is the result of this and this. You, you cannot have this in, in autoencoder. Uh, there is no guidance to choose the size of bottleneck layer, uh, needs a considerable amount of data to generate useful results. Uh, it is optimized to modern normal behavior, not outliers. Uh, it's more prone to overfitting uh, than linear methods like tensor and matrix factorization. And from the computational point of view, it's horrible because you cannot have any estimation of the time complexity. Uh, so uh, then we have an angle-based methods. Uh, the idea of angle-based method is that uh, uh, if we get uh, um, uh, two, p uh, two points from the data and compute the, the angles to the reference point P, if this is an outlier, this, this uh, degree, I mean, these angles that P has with any two pair of data doesn't change too much, right? 
it goes probably from 45 degrees to 30 degrees or something like that. But if we look at the uh, in layer or normal object, uh, if we uh, get a pair of uh, uh, data points, random pair of data points, and compute the angles of this point with this uh, pair, it get it get a uh, varying uh, with high variance of angles we get. Mm? This is the idea of about. Mm? So I give you an example how about is computed. So for point P, let's say that we get these two random points from data and the angles between these two vectors becomes 45. So the abode is computed like this. So we have abode of 0 0.4. And then if we get, uh, we get uh, changed it to, to these points, the angle becomes 15. So the abode becomes 0, 0 0.8. Uh, for this point, the same. And then if you apply for this, uh, if you uh, uh, compute the variance of Abbott values, becomes 0 0.03. And let's do this for point N, which is we think that is normal points. Uh, if we get these two points, the, the, the degree is uh, uh, 120. Um, and then if, for this point is 10 degrees, uh, this about becomes this and this and this. If you continue for, for all points, the variance of angles uh, has uh, resulted to the having higher variance on, on the about value. So what that means, that means that this should be an outlier because these angles vary between 15 to 45, while this one between 5 to 175. This is a code for Abode. Abode is parameter free, doesn't need any hyperparameter to set. It is very good for higher dimensional data because angles uh, are different from distances. So we don't suffer from computing similarities. They can also can detect many types of outliers. But there's a disadvantage is that they cannot detect isolated outliers in dense area, and they are not scalable. So they are cubic time complexity. We can have a fast approximation by quadratic, but this still is too much. Now let's go to the ensemble approach. The, the most popular one is isolation forest. The main idea is that the easier uh, to isolate, uh, isolate the instance, the higher the chance that is an outlier. So for instance, here you see that these people are together. But these people are, are in the lower density area, so uh, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, easier to isolate them than one of these members, right? So normal instance is assumed that many points are on it. It's difficult to isolate. And outlier instance is alone in the space, so easy to isolate. Let's, let's see an example. We first, let's uh, take a subsample of data. Let's uh, say that our data has 100. Um, uh, examples, and we take only six points. Mm -hmm. And we start with six points. And then uh, we, we pick a random feature, like uh, imagine this is a weight or this is a height. We uh, pick a random feature, and we make a random uh, a split. Mm -hmm. We split the data at uh, 11, right? So uh, these points become isolated very fast. Mm -hmm. The first uh, cut, it got out. Then we go to the other points. Uh, we make now we go to the, the, the other feature, which is uh, y, and then we make another cut, right? So no isolation point, no points become isolated. So we see we still need to continue this. So we put uh, x equal to seven. We make a cut for the above part, and now we have two isolation points, right? Uh, now we go to the bottom part. We make uh, another split. Now we have uh, one isolated, five, five. And then we need another split for this too. So we, make, we make another split. And finally, we have these them also covered. Hmm? Uh, this is one was uh, one random uh, isolation tree. We need to make uh, various, several number of isolation trees to, it works. Now let's uh, do this another way. Let's start with feature Y, split the data. Okay, no isolation points. So we need to split more. Now we got it. The red points got isolated. Let's continue. Let's make another split. OK, one, one more, five, five become isolated. Now we got another split. This one also becomes isolated, 
right? So we remove them. And finally, we, we uh, last cut, we can separate these two as well. So finally, we have this. Now, we have two isolation random, uh, random isolation tree. But what is interesting about uh, this random isolation tree is that, as you can see, this, this observation that we think that was abnormal appears uh, in, becomes isolated more sooner than the others. Let's compute the average depths. Uh, so it, uh, in the first random isolation tree, it becomes isolated in the depths one, and the second one is two, so average is become 1.5. Let's compute this for others. And we see that, okay, this guy actually isolated most, uh, more uh, faster than the others. So uh, this is uh, abnormal and this one is normal because uh, the, the average depth is three, 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 and this one is the 1.5. So in this example, we generate only two trees and one sum sample. But in basic, in, uh, basically in practice, we need to generate several isolation trees like 100 from several subsamples to make this work. This is the code for isolation forest. So this is the state of the art in practical applications. Everyone now uh, talks about isolation forest. If you go to industry, this is the state of the art. Mm -hmm. Simple, super fast, efficient, linear time complexity, low memory requirements. Uh, and it's the only uh, anomaly detection approach that uh, optim uh, finds uh, address attacks the anomalies instead of uh, uh, creating a profile for normal data. It can be used for detection or also novelty detection uh, and is a non-parametric, no assumption. Mm -hmm. But uh, it requires the prior knowledge on the ratio of outliers. It's not suitable for ultra high dimensional data, but uh, still there are lots of solutions for these kind of things because many, many researchers are working to improve this. Uh, and then we have feature bagging. Uh, I explained the feature bagging. So imagine that this, we have this feature matrix we generate uh, randomly a uh, set of features like uh, nearby low or funny. We apply uh, our uh, uh, anomaly detection algorithm of interest, and then we see which one gets uh, out, out, becomes outlier. So we point uh, one uh, a score for Alice because it becomes outlier in these two three feature matrices using KNN. Now let's do apply LOF on this new three feature matrix, loyal, funny, and rich. Still, Alice becomes outliers, and and also Joey becomes outlier. So Joey uh, uh, gets one outlier score. If we do this for four random features, nearby, loyal, funny, rich, uh, we get Alice again uh, for the um, uh, random feature uh, subset: uh, white, muscular, luxury car, and luxury house. Uh, still Alice and, and, and Monica got the uh, score. And if, if you, you compute the cumulative uh, uh, score of outliers in N tries, uh, we can identify outliers because uh, Alice got the highest appeared as outlier in many of these sub features, right? Uh, so this is the code for feature bagging. Uh, this is a general and flexible fork to combine the output of multiple outlier detection methods, and it's suitable for high dimensional noisy data. Uh, still, uh, it also inherits the drawbox of uh, methods using in ensemble. Uh, now the practical issues, evaluation metrics. Uh, we have accuracy, where it's computed as uh, TN plus TP, true negative plus true positive, divided by uh, uh, the the whole number of samples. So it becomes here in these examples, becomes uh, this value. We have precision, which is a true positive divided by true positive plus false positive. So a three divided by this two, three plus two becomes this one. We have the recall or detection ratio, uh, TP divided by TB plus FN. So three victory cases divided by victory cases plus missed alarms becomes this. Hmm? And then we have false positive rate, which is two false alarm divided by no problem plus false alarm, right? This becomes this, and then false negative rate, one missed alarm to the missed alarm plus victory. Hmm? And this is the, and then we have F measure, which is a combination of missed alarm, false alarm and victory. So it becomes this value. You can uh, see the summary of this. Uh, but uh, if you want to see which anomaly detection is better, then you need the uh, 
to test each solution with its possible hyperparameters. For instance, for k and n, you vary k from 1 to 100, and then uh, you compute uh, t uh, true positive and false positives and precision recalls, and then you plot a rock curve and precision recall curves. Uh, so rock curve only uh, consider the missing alarm ratio, while the precision recall consider both miss alarms and false alarms. Mm -hmm. so these are the most uh, popular uh, ways to evaluate different solutions for anomaly detection. Mm -hmm. So, and this is a random detector, and this is a random detector, and this is the ideal performance that we want to be there. Mm -hmm. Uh, there were, uh, if you want to see which algorithm is more popular in the literature, is Isolation Forest, which uh, um, appeared in 2008 and received uh, 6,000 citations. Uh, and also in the in the benchmark study by uh, that is uh, what is presented in uh, Pi OD package, they show that Isolation Forest is the rank uh, as obtained the rank of one uh, on the, this uh, 17 data sets uh, uh, becomes the number one. Uh, so this is a package uh, PyOD, uh, Python package for outlier detection. That is, in, they implemented 31 of these uh, algorithms. So you can use them. Uh, and this, this is a summary. There is no single universal algorithm for anomaly detection. This is very important to know. Uh, each of these models is designed for a purpose. So it's normal that they produce, produce different results. Uh, so they, mod, they focus on a specific aspect of data problem like uh, high dimensionality, higher order data, nonlinear, uh, linear separatable data, sparse or dense data, noisy or clean data, global or local outliers, collective or isolated outliers, multimodal or uh, unimodal data, and multivariate or univariate data. Right? This is the references for literature, and this is the references for methods and algorithms. Um, I will upload. Uh, the code and the data sets, so you can re recreate uh, all of these figures and results in this presentation yourself. Um, and thank you very much. Yeah.